I was asked to discuss the fourth industrial, the so-called fourth industrial revolution. The main point today is, should we be concerned by the fourth industrial revolution? So the, the main question is, how much should we be concerned? Uh, it's certainly an important discussion. The first industrial revolution brought important political changes, like especially Marxism and the welfare state. These were two answers to the first industrial revolution. In part of the world, we had a Marxist system. In other parts of the world, we had a welfare state. Then we had globalization that brought what we are calling today populism 2.0. Now we are approaching the third wave, automation, large-scale automation. So what sort of changes this will bring? And what can we do about it as educators? So technological change has preoccupied humanity for a long time. As you see, Aristoteles, as we say in Spanish, was already worried about this. Now, we need a historical perspective. Much of the current literature, much of the current articles on the fourth industrial revolution look to me as a bit ahistorical because they don't really take into consideration what happened in the past. The fourth industrial revolution is not something coming in a vacuum. It has to be understood as part of a historical trend. So there was what I call the, the first industrial revolution or zero industrial revolution that was the Neolithic revolution. There was fire coming into the hands of humanity. So you already had some occupations there that were reducing importance, like hunting. And you had new occupations like farming. Then you, had, then you have what we call now the industrial revolution which brought steam, electricity, mass production, and you had a lot of social upheaval because people were losing their jobs. Artisanal weavers, lamplighters, farm laborers. Most people who worked in the agricultural part of the economy in the first half of the 19th century. Now, very, little, very, very few people do. Now, in the 50s, the third in, in, industrial revolution started. It's called, or usually called, the information revolution. It is based on the general purpose programmable computer, what we usually call computer. And it, br it brought considerable upheaval as well that we are still feeling. We, we don't really know what will happen. It hasn't ended yet. So, but you already have occupations that have disappeared. For example, the elevator operator, the chariot driver, typesetters, factory workers. About 20% of the population used to work in factories in the 50s. Now it has come to 8, 9%. And you have new occupations like software development, e-commerce, web design. All these new occupations did not exist 25, 30 years ago. And then you have the fourth column, what we are calling now the fourth industrial revolution that I call the intelligence revolution. The World Economic Forum is one of the most well-known institutions pushing for this name. And the steam engine or the main drivers of this revolution are robotics, artificial intelligence, the Internet of Things, and you already are worried, people are worried because these intelligent changes, and I will come back to this a little bit later, what it, does it mean? Some occupations are already being, are feeling the heat, like will we really need human financial traders? Will we need credit analysts? Will we need drivers? Because we will have driverless cars, driverless buses, driverless trucks, and you have some occupations that are changing very quickly, like accountant. Who needs accountants now to do bookkeeping? It's automated. Uh, some phases of the lawyer work are changing, what is called discovery. Discovery is an important side of the legal work. 
is being automated as well. Music producers. And you have completely new occupations that did not exist a decade ago, like cyber security specialists, social media analysts, data analysts. Data analyst is the most important profession now in the United States. According to LinkedIn, uh, when you analyze wages and the number of openings, the profession with more demand is data analyst now. There is no way the current supply of data analysts is going to satisfy the demand. Now, and when you look into the future, you already can foresee the, the fifth industrial revolution, especially in the area of biology, genetics, the fusion between medicine and genetics, biology, the understanding of the brain. So you, co you can already think of occupations that will change a lot, like psychotherapists, or more relevant to us, teachers. What will we do as teachers when there will be machinery that can, between quotes, understand, that one can understand lang natural language, can understand written responses in free form? Now, what are the variables that influence the impact of technological change? Or in other words, what are the variables that influence the number of jobs that will be phased out or phased in? Well, you have variables, most economists speak about three main variables. The speed and scale of technological change, the level of skills, and I will come back to this, because as an educational institution, the skill gap is the name of our main challenge for the future. And talent mobility, so how much are people willing to move between companies, between cities, between countries. I would like to discuss with you, using this drawing, what happens with occupations when there is a big wave of technological change. As you know, there are a few researchers, especially Benedict Frey from Oxford, that have started a big chain reaction of articles research projects discussing how many jobs will be killed in the future. I personally believe the methodology they use is flawed because they only look at this side of the drawing. They only look, they only look at the occupations that disappear. We have a big mass of evidence from his, the economic historians showing that in all industrial revolutions they are, there are not only occupations that disappear, there are also occupations which are new coming into the market. And the real problem is not how many occupations disappear or are automated, as they say, but the balance between occupations being phased out and occupations, new occupations coming into the market. So, when you, look, when you think about jobs or occupations and you think about this big wave of automation coming in, you will find, yes, Benedict Frey and all the other people are right. There will be some occupations that will disappear, as you see here. Maybe a lot of the occupations will disappear. But other things will happen. For example, if you look here, you will see that a lot of new occupations will be there as well. It is interesting to show, it's interesting to note, that the new occupations usually will be high skill, high pay. Because in the labor market, we are looking, we are now seeing a polarization. There are very few middle of the road, so to speak, occupations. You have high skill, high pay, low skill, low pay. So, the problem now is that there is, there is a diminishing stock of medium pay, medium skill occupations. Those are being automated. Some, some people go over the fence to high skill, high pay and have a good life. And some people are trapped into low skill, low pay. So we, as part of the educational system, our moral responsibility and our mission is to help people jump over the fence into the high skill jobs. So, as I was saying, occupations are 
affected by technological change and then you have some occupations disappear as I was showing here some occupations are new into the market and then you have some occupations that are modified they change like graphic designer printing shops do not work in the same way secretarial assistants do not work in the same way and then you have a large part of the economy that is basically unmodified and this is where most of the new economic research or technological research is flawed because when you automate a lot of occupations you increase productivity when you increase productivity you lower prices you raise quality and then you raise demand so although some occupations disappear the general level of the economy improves and you need a lot more people because you are seeing the effect that you see in China now in China you have 200 million people coming into the middle class these 200 million people need want and can pay for hairdressers masseurs people who walk their dogs mechanics for their cars people for the cable television etc so the general level of the economy improves now if you look here at this side of the drawing i think this is the key for us as art or as education as educators because there is a relatively limited number of occupations which disappear there is a limited number of occupations who are, which are new and appear into the market but a large number of occupations change some of them are de-skilled meaning you don't really need to know anything to perform them but some others are reskilled you have to change your knowledge or upskilled you have to learn new things so as as educators we have to make sure that we build the bridges we create systems for people not to stick to the current jobs which are not going to exist anymore but they can really perform the new jobs so jobs will be disappearing but employment in general will not what we need is to make sure that the people will be able to perform the new jobs now consider that 20 percent of the u.s workforce for example is working now in an occupation that did not exist in 1980 so here you have an example of a, a classic example of a, an occupation that disappeared elevator operators as you can see there was a peak in the 50s of the number of elevator operators but then with the appearance with the rising of the automatic elevator they just disappeared so this happens now what is different about the fourth industrial revolution why is it different than the previous ones the first is the availability of big data we have masses of data now as you have read in the newspapers for example Cambridge Analytica knows who, what to do with this data you have millions millions of uh, people using social networks uh, computer glasses video watching Netflix all this information is stored and with the new machine learning algorithm which, which are fed with that big data you can for the first time in humanity you can really use artificial intelligence algorithms that really work if you have masses of data and you also have the improved contextual intelligence you have for the first time computer vision you have natural language understanding so when these three trends really feed into each other when you really can pull together these three trends is when you get what they call intelligent algorithm and you can have really non-predictable tasks like driving driverless cars are still a big way ahead maybe you read 
Two days ago, an Uber car in Arizona killed a woman, a driverless car, so we have a long and bumpy road ahead, but it's happening. Now, what are the attributes of the fourth industrial revolution? It is capital intensive, it is skill intensive, and it's labor saving. What do you mean by capital intensive? It means that the level of money you have is more important than, than the quantity of labor you put into a process. And I'll give you an example of this in a few moments. It is skill intensive, in meaning that the people who know more profit more of this revolution because they are computer programmers, web designers, uh, financial engineers. Now, history has shown that the net impact in terms of jobs is positive. But it has also shown that you have to make sure that people learn whatever they need to learn. Otherwise, they will not be able to reach these jobs. So the question is for you, in your schools, in your countries, in your cities, and in each country the answer may be different. So is the fourth industrial revolution just another Schumpeterian wave? Schumpeter was an economist that said there were waves of creative destruction. That was first industrial revolution and second and third industrial revolutions. So at the end of the day, things settled down. But there are now exceptionalists, people who say that the fourth industrial revolution is different, that we are looking into a dystopian future, a future in which, contrary to the past, we will not get the jobs needed to fill the gap. So you really have two schools of thought here. So, why would the impact of the fourth industrial revolution be different? Well, for the first time, we can deal with what they, they call the Pollyanni paradox. The Pollyanni paradox is a name used by computer scientists to refer to the very surprising fact that things that are easy for people are difficult for computers and things that are difficult for people are easy for computers. For example, walking is very easy for us. Shouting is very easy for us. Cooking is easy for us, but it's difficult for computers because those are, in many ways, unexplicit processes, things that we know tacitly. We know tacitly how to comfort somebody, how to persuade, how to flirt. We know tacitly how to do many things that we, we cannot tell to a programmer, so he cannot program it. On the other hand, we can describe very accurately how do you do bookkeeping, or how do you wheel the door to a car. So some things are very easy for computers and very difficult for people, and the other way around. This is called the Pollyanni paradox. Now, for the first time, we can overcome the Pollyanne paradox because traditional programming is unable to automate unexplicit processes. But the new machine learning paradigms, for the first time in history, can deal with unexplained processes, unexplicit processes. So in this sense, the exceptionalist may have a point. So now, until now, humans had a niche. The niche was there, was, there is no way that computers can automate things that I cannot explain, things that make me human, things that belong to my emotions, my soul, my capacity to care, my capacity to love, my capacity to persuade, my capacity to be charismatic. But now, maybe all this will change. So what will be the niche of humans in the future? Now, it's very important for us as educators to think of the skills gap because as the automation process comes higher in the value chain, as things that usually were thought as part of the tacit knowledge, like driving, for example, are now coming into the automation field, things that were previously non-automatable are now becoming automatable, like driving, for example, or flying. So 
we will have to compete, humans, based on the law of comparative advantage, the, us the, the economic classic law of comparative advantage, meaning machines will do whatever they do best. And if they do best many more things, they will do many more things. So, so where we as humans move, we will have to move into very high skill jobs. This is the reason the educational system in the 21st century is the key to competitiveness in society. Look at this. During previous waves of automation, people just switch jobs from a routine job to another routine job. So ATMs, the automatic teller machines, rendered obsolete the job of the bank cashier. So now you have 20% less bank cashiers, but you have lots of people working in banks. So they moved from an administrative job to another administrative job. But now it will be different. People will need to move into very different types of jobs where they, have, they will have to show, as you can see here, they will have to show to apply, professionally speaking, empathy, problem solving. You have to speak to clients, to customers, to peers. You have people we have to learn how to build relationships, creativity, cultural sensitivity. These are very difficult things to teach and very difficult things to learn. So our schools are tooled or designed to teach different kinds of things. Mathematics, physics, programming, art history, design. Those are things that were developed by humans. But all these attributes that you can see here, all these skills belong to human personality. And how do you teach personality traits? is a very difficult question and there is very little evidence that it can be done really in a proper way so we as educators we will have to shed to a some point to a certain extent our habit of 20 centuries of teaching analytic things analytic content and we will have to find a way if we want to help our citizens the citizens of our societies to find new jobs we will have to find a way to teach them these sort of skills. Now, citizens will need support in many ways. One of them, obviously, is to acquire relevant skills. They will need courses online, offline, lifelong learning, short courses, long courses, workplace-based, school-based, home-based, peer teaching. But, we also, but citizens will also need help for, to search new jobs. It won't be as easy as today. Jobs will be performed in the virtual world. They will be performed in networks. Uh, employers will change. Very few people will work uh, in conventional employers. People will work in networks. They will work in what is called the gig economy, like Uber drivers, uh, like mechanical Turk um, workers. And also people will have to move between companies, between cities. When you, in some countries, when you switch companies, you have problems with your health care. You have problems with your pension fund. Uh, if you move between, in some countries you cannot move between cities, like China, for example, that you need a special permission. Uh, in any case, citizens will need a lot of support, not only to learn, but also to move and also to search for opportunities. And this level of challenge really hasn't been seen by humanity in a long time. We will need what I call this between quotes, uh, it's my expression, my term. I call it a social learning system. And it will have to be public. Public in the sense, not in the sense that is used in the UK, but public in the sense that the economists use, meaning finance publicly. 
because the train investments will be very big. So one company will not be happy to train a lot of people and when they are trained they move to another company. Uh, for these reasons, it will, it, the risk has to be shifted to the state. The shift has to be, the risk has to be shifted to society. So there is a need for public financing of social learning. How, how is it going to be financed? Nobody knows. There are bad ideas around, very bad ideas. Taxing robots, like Mr. Gates proposed, is a bad, very bad idea. It's like taxing tractors in 1920s. Uh, another very bad idea is UBI, Universal Basic in Income, because it goes against the idea of building skills. It's, it goes in the opposite way of making people stay at home. So I'm sure we will need some taxes. Uh, Monsieur Macron in France is experimenting uh, with new taxes and new systems for uh, financing retraining. Uh, they are now, France is um, showcasing uh, a social account for people to have uh, a few thousand euros every year to finance the, the learning. Nobody knows. This is really frontline thinking at this time. Now, about the schools. What, what, what should schools take care? Because we are a network of schools, all has to think about this deeply. We have a mission, we have a responsibility to society. So first of all, I think we have to change something that has been wired upon us as humans for many centuries. We usually study 80% of the time during 20% of our life. Until, nine, until 25 years old, we are usually full-time students or close to full-time students. School, high school, university, uh, some people have to go to the army, some people have to go somewhere else, but usually in the big numbers what you see is people devo devoting 80% of their time to education during 20% of their life. And in the rest of their life, in the rest of their life, very little happens. This will have to change. Another thing that will have to change is in all our schools, most of our effort is in teaching and very little in reteaching or retooling or retraining or reskilling. This will also have to change. We will, we will have to look again at our budgets, at our technology, at our teachers, at our curricula. How are, you going, how are we going to retool ourselves to become lifelong teaching institutions? Schools, we have to revise pedagogies because, as I was saying before, teaching personality traits is very different. It's a different game. We need different teachers, maybe, different pedagogies, different assessments. Do you think this is the time to be rethinking the model, the traditional model of schooling altogether, to be thinking about a total restructure? Well, depends on what you mean by school. If you, if you mean primary school, I, I wouldn't think so. But if you think technical school, secondary school, university, I think yes. Because I think the um, principal marker of in, in, the, in, the new, in the future will be the acceleration of obsolescence. So when we teach now, the validity of the half-life, as we say, of knowledge is now more or less the length of the degree. For example, in our university we teach computer science. The computer science degree is about five years. What we teach in the first year in the fourth year is already obsolete. So now the span is more or less three, four years. In 10 years, the validity of knowledge will probably be a year and a half. In 20 years, the validity of knowledge will be maybe six months. So schools, for adults at least, are built on the assumption, the paradigm, 
Now, in school design or school structure, is that you learn, then you apply. Now, if knowledge becomes obsolete after six months, you cannot continue with this paradigm. It's, I learn and then I apply. You probably will have to shift to something like, I learn while I apply, I apply while I learn, I produce knowledge at the same rate and I consume knowledge, I apply knowledge at the same time then I produce the knowledge. So I think there are very basic things in the way schools were created in the Bible. In the Bible there are, um, you can find in the Jewish Bible already definitions of schools. In the Jewish Bible you can find that the recommended number of students is 25. The recommended time for teaching is two hours. All these things are already in the Bible. That people should be organized according to their age. The only problem in the Bible is that women were excluded at that time. But most of the main factors that are recognizable today in schools, timetables, the shape of the classroom, like where you are now. You have a classroom, you have somebody in the front, uh, I am one, you are many, uh, I speak, you ask. All, all these basic actions, all these basic variables are already in the Bible, so many years. It was different for the Greeks. The Greeks had a different paradigm. They have a paradigm based on a tutor. So, but the problem with that was that only the, the, the son of princes will get an education. Everybody else didn't know what to do. But then, yes, I think part of the educational system we have to change and change a lot in the way it is financed, in the way it is delivered. Otherwise, people will lose their opportunity to earn the living and universal basic income will not solve it. Are, are there any subjects or areas of the curriculum that you think a school could safely drop? It's very difficult to change curricula really. It has legal issues and, and everything. But the main question here is, I believe that in the future, because of the accelerated obsolescence, methods will be more important than content. It doesn't matter what you teach. It will not matter very much. What will matter is how you teach. What will matter is what sort of habits you create in people, what sorts of reflexes you create. You have to create a habit of lifelong learning. You have to teach people the ways and means of being continuous learners. They will have to be critical of themselves, when they have to learn again, when they have to share the learning, where they, find, they can find the knowledge. The knowledge that people need, in the, that people will need in the future, will not be found in schools. It will be found in the internet, in, work, in, in workplaces, uh, in chats. The knowledge will be in the cloud. So the role of the school is not to be a repository and distributor of knowledge. We are not warehouse of knowledge. We have to teach how to think. We will have to teach people the tools, the instruments of adapting themselves continuously on how to look for knowledge, how to make sure they understood it properly, how, how they understand the way to apply it properly. Jorge, he's, he's saying that in Alt Brazil, they're moving from STEM to STEAM, so they're integrating the arts. Is this uh, a wise move? Well, I am a computer engineer, but even though I am a computer engineer, I don't, I don't really believe in the existence or the relevance of a big frontier between the scientific, the so-called, between quote, scientific subjects and the humanities. I don't believe in that. I've seen in my life lots of so-called scientists who are not driven by evidence, not rigorous enough, and I've seen art historians 
who are uh, or, or, or literature critics which are very strict with their use of evidence their methodology so in a sense i believe the steam movement i, I am not fan, i'm not a fan of the steam movement i think people students have to receive a balanced menu of subjects and furthermore i would say as i was saying obsolence will be one of the attributes of knowledge in the future but the other attribute will be multidisciplinarity so the difference between art history and graphic design will be very slim so you have to understand things now for a multidisciplinary perspective i think we we cannot teach anymore in silos we cannot teach physics separated from mathematics and separated from biology uh, i think things will have to move in that sense project-based teaching is a good idea i think um, i certainly believe that people need art artistic education cultural education and scientific education but not as separate fields in the mind they have to work together to make sure we have an intelligent dynamic person in society okay so with with the, with the fast pace of change and the problem of obsolescence ollie's saying that it's difficult to find teachers even young teachers who have the, the capacity to cope and to keep up with this change and to stay ahead of the children yes where, where is she going to find teachers well we we will have to redefine teaching and then redefine teachers uh, in it's absolutely true what what you find in mexico as a challenge is a challenge all over the world it's, it's very difficult so we will have to focus on on teaching how to learn instead of teaching content so students will have to learn there is no we will have to move from the model of the teacher knows the student doesn't know or the teacher knows and in some way magical way transfer knowledge to the student this model is not going to work in the future because the teacher doesn't really need to know Java++ plus 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 to teach programming he needs to know or she needs to know the concepts behind programming and the student has to learn Java or whatever he needs so we we will have to shift to a model where teachers and schools concentrate on the personality of the student on the mental capacity of the student on the attitude of the student but the student will have to look for the technical specific knowledge he will have to get it from the cloud he will have to get it from peers we have to teach students to learn from each other this sort of resources uh, will have to make do because we won't find teachers that every six months will, will be able to refresh their knowledge. 